Representative Anna Eshoo, who is one of the um, chairs of the Congressional Internet Caucus. Um, I want to just welcome you guys all to today's event. It's titled Elections in the Age of AI, Analyzing 2024 and Shaping Future Campaigns. Uh, this is a, a, an event hosted by the Congressional Internet Caucus Academy in conjunction with the Congressional Internet Caucus and its co-chairs, which is, includes my boss um, and uh, Congressman McCall on the House side and Mr. Thune, who is the new Majority Leader on the Senate side. Um, we also want to thank Representative Kevin Kiley, who helped us get this room and his staff. That's very helpful because it's not always that easy to get rooms on the Hill, if you guys knew that. I'm sorry, I feel like my coming in and out, but so it, it is what it is. Um, we did these for, we've been doing these briefings for a long time. There was a brief pause during the COVID pandemic, but this year we've been bringing them back. And this is, I don't know, like the fourth or fifth one this year, probably. Um, they, they, I always find them very in, interesting and informative, and I hope you guys continue to do this because. Unfortunately, Congresswoman Eshoo is retiring at the end of the year, so she won't be the co-chair anymore, and I won't be doing this anymore. So hopefully you guys keep coming around after that. Um, I just want to take a quick moment before I introduce uh, the moderator to thank Tim and the Congressional Caucus Academy and all of his people for doing these things for over the years. This is on behalf of me and Congressman Eshoo. You guys have been very helpful. I don't know if you guys also know this, but they also run the Congressional App Challenge, which is might be the single most important um, thing that happens in Congress that nobody knows about outside of uh, this, these walls. Um, your, your district staff should know about it a lot, and certainly students across the country know about it, but it's really great, and I encourage all of you guys to get involved in that if you can, and Tim and his people do a really good job of doing that every year. Um, but I'll just go ahead and introduce uh, Oma Sadiq, who is a technology policy reporter for Bloomberg Government. She's going to be the moderator of today's event, and thank you very much. Hi everyone, good afternoon, welcome. Thank you all for being here today for this discussion on AI's role in the 2024 elections. Um, to kick us off, I'm gonna have you, each of you introduce yourselves quickly, and then afterwards, tell me right now how you're feeling about the future of AI and the future of US elections, specifically integrity of US elections. Yeah, Tim? At the same time. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Tim Harper. Uh, I lead elections and democracy work at the Center for Democracy and Technology, which is a 30-year-old nonprofit organization that works on civil rights issues in the modern age. Uh, to answer the question, I think the future of uh, AI is bright, and uh, the future of American elections will be secure, safe, and accessible as they are and have always been. That said, uh, there definitely are complications that new technologies create as uh, for elections and that uh, there are issues that we can and need to find solutions. Um, how we go about that, I think, is something that a great panel will uh, we'll have a conversation about. Thanks. Jennifer. Hi, I'm Jennifer Huddleston, and I'm a senior fellow in technology policy at the Cato Institute. Uh, I'm also very optimistic about AI as a technology, and I think it's really important that when we think about AI as a technology, and particularly when we think about AI as a technology in the election space, that we think about it as more than just generative AI, that we're thinking about more than just chat GPT or fears of manipulated media when we're talking about AI. I certainly can understand that there are concerns about potential complications, as Tim alluded to, but I think that there should hopefully be, after this last election, where there had been a lot of fears prior to the election that didn't actually pan out, a lot of optimism and a lot more conversation about the potential opportunities of AI in the election space as well. The positive impact we can also see of a new technology, both in improving things like cybersecurity in elections, but also in empowering voters and enabling candidates to further reach their constituents. Yeah, um, I'm Kara Frederick. I run tech policy at the Heritage Foundation, and I shockingly agree with everything Jennifer just said. Um, in terms of AI, yeah, I'm extremely optimistic uh, about the benefits of this technology, the opportunities uh, as you laid out. I remember when I started studying AI policy in the think tank world after coming from industry in 2018, uh, the the dialogue and all of the discourse was killer robots, you know, Terminator, Skynet, 
And um, the fact that in 2024, we've been able to, to move past that and have really sophisticated conversations um, and really down to earth conversations about what this technology actually does, uh, not just what it can do in a, in a fanciful manner, uh, that to me is extremely encouraging. And you know, I think there are obviously some pain points as we'll probably discuss and some potential pitfalls, but if we can make the technology Number one, do what it does best. So let machines do what machines do best and let humans do what humans do best. And if we can harness it to work for us, to work for that you know, divine spark that is intrinsic only and unique to only human beings and make them work for people like the middle class, then we can, I believe, truly harness these technologies for good. And that's the only way that I think the, th the four of us will continue to remain optimistic about these technologies and really avoid the the doomerism, as well as the, the talk of another AI winter um, that has thus far seemed to permeate a lot of at least the, the think tankers in DC when we talk about AI policy. So initially hearing a lot of optimism around AI and, and its trajectory, um, I bet that has a lot to do with what we saw in 2024. So let's start off with what did happen. I mean, we saw plenty of deep fakes, the Biden robocall, um, several of Kamala Harris, especially towards the end of the election. Um, early on, or if you guys can recall, Trump hugging Fauci all the way in early stages, uh, back during the primary. Um, but what didn't happen, as many, many, many experts had predicted, was this AI disinfo apocalypse. You know, that AI is going to wreak havoc on the elections, on the integrity of elections, undermine our elections, undermine the democratic process. Um, why did that not? happen. Tim, if you want to start off. Sure. So uh, I think that, you know, talking about what we saw, what we didn't see in 2024, the first thing I'll say is that there's still a lot of learning to be done here. We didn't fully understand the information ecosystem and mis and disinformation operations affecting the 2016 and 2020 elections until afterwards. And so researchers are currently collecting data and investigating what has happened, and a lot of that is still to come. That said, to your point, we did see some instances of AI's misuse in elections this year, in many instances perpetrated by foreign governments, right? There were uh, fake and dupe websites generated by the Russian government uh, in order to confuse uh, American voters. There were incidents of deep fakes uh, depicting an accuser of, uh, uh, of vice president candidate uh, Tim Walls of sexual misconduct, right? There were um, a number of other uh, deep fakes. But in addition to those things, we were also worried about how these tools could be used to, uh, for instance, uh, target uh, folks at a, at a more hyper-targeted micro level than, than we've seen in the past. And we did see some of that come to fruition. For instance, there were some text messages sent to Wisconsin student, students telling them that if they voted and were non-citizens that they would be sent to jail, which were seen as intimidating, which were seen to be generated by artificial intelligence. There were some incidents of um, foreign language misinformation uh, that was spread to Spanish-speaking voters in Florida and other places to uh, confuse them about things like um, uh, you know, hurricanes Helene and Milton being generated by the government in order to suppress uh, turnout in, um, in Florida for the election, right? Uh, but separate from those things, I think the most kind of pernicious thing that we saw this year is that generative AI and kind of it's the kind of people's understanding and information about it resulted in a decreased trust in truth. Um, uh, and, and I think that's something that is something we'll have to be reconciling with for a long time, which is that um, uh, you know, it's much more difficult for folks to believe reality in a world where generative AI makes a lot of fake things very believable. Um, that said, those are some of the risks and some of the things we really did see. I think there were some other threats that we anticipated seeing that um, we didn't. Fortunately, I'll say, I think the highest risk period where, in which we might have seen more disinformation emerge from foreign and domestic actors would have been during the post-election period in the instance of a very close um, outcome. Fortunately, uh, we did not see a kind of protracted legal battle um, uh, during the election cycle this year, which likely means that some of the kind of most sophisticated campaigns that could have done things like mobilize people for political violence were unlikely and uh, to, were less likely to happen this year. 
I will just add, I think when we're talking about these things, we, we of course did see AI tools as part of the conversation around misinformation, around disinformation, but we did not see that apocalypse that was predicted. We did not see widespread use of AI tools to create deep fakes that would somehow sway the election. I also think it's important when we're having this conversation that we take a step back and ask the question, where are we distinguishing AI from just typical tools that have been used in the past? We have still continue to see things like Photoshop or various other tactics used that may not, you know, spoofing or things like that, that may not be using AI as the technology. The other thing I would add is what we've seen is that there is an entire, you know, ecosystem built that helps people understand the information they may encounter. That while at times it may make them a bit skeptical, knowing that these tools are out there in general, that when we have seen things like the Biden robocall, there was a very quick response to that where individuals could consider the information available and make the decision for themselves about how they want it to react to this, that they're aware that these technologies are out there and that therefore they're able to engage in critical thinking and ideally be critical media consumers when they encounter this technology. We also saw a variety of things use, you know, different, different elements when it comes to helping to inform the public in terms of knowing what is or is not potentially manipulated. Yeah, and I think, you know, the, the practical applications can't be discounted. Uh, when we were first working with these technologies, um, I was deployed in the field, and I, I like to give people a good example of how machines work and, and what AI actually does look like, and it, it is kind of boring. Um, so when we were deployed, especially if you're in a, you know, a forward operating base, um, a tactical operations center within that, we had a line of FMV analysts who would just pour over drone footage and their whole job was to label like motorcycles or rocks or trees and whatnot and feed that information back to us, the analysts, the targeters, um, so we could, you know, figure out how to, to basically have a better targeting process. And what AI can do, especially something like a computer vision algorithm, is again, machines can do what machines do best and humans can do what they do best. So instead of having those guys being served, brought their lunches, you know, four of them sitting there just all day, every day, you replace that with a computer vision algorithm and they can identify trees better, rocks better, much more quickly. They can intake that information, they can identify patterns, and they can ID anomalies much, much quicker with the machine, and then you can reserve a lot of the analytical rigor that a human has to then analyze and just do better targeting in general, again, more sophisticated analytics once you have that initial information from a machine. So what we saw in the election, that's sort of, sort of my analogy, very similar things. Machines were identifying patterns. They were detecting anomalies. They were having highly granular voter profiling. Um, we, yeah, we saw a little bit of the synthetic media and whatnot, but I think right now, by and large, society is pretty attuned to what that looks like, with one funny exception. I saw uh, on, on X um, a little girl carrying a puppy after one of the hurricanes and crying, and I was totally fooled, and I was like, oh, crap, this is actually AI. But it's, you know, it's synthetic media. It's these digital forgeries that, by and large, did not, as we, we saw in in previous election cycles have much of an impact. So it was really the, the boring stuff, that, that pattern recognition, the predictive um, uh, capabilities of, of voting trends and whatnot, that uh, data analysis, that kind of what we used to call micro-targeting of you know, potential voters in vulnerable states that, that we saw because machines are doing what machines are doing best in that regard. Um, some of the things that I'm surprised that we haven't seen, even though we saw a little bit of um, uh, you know, potential that way, there was a tech company that pitched to the Biden campaign, they could create an AI-generated Trump to spar with him in terms of debate preparation. So I expect to see applications uh, more like that. I was talking to uh, Chatham House Rules. Uh, I was talking to uh, somebody from uh, in a you know, very important AI company, and what, when they said, okay, think about some of the use cases that are, again, a little more boring. Think of, you know, you're a think tank. How are you going to anticipate, uh, we're a partisan organization at the Heritage Foundation, how would you anticipate some of the, the left's protest to this piece of model legislation? AI can generate that and start that cycle. So I think we're going to see more and more use cases that are very similar to that as we saw in the past election and 
um, nothing too crazy about deep fakes changing the election. The one fanciful item that I want to claim, and I want to, sorry to hold the floor too long, um, but, but I want to get this out there so everyone credits me when it actually happens for being first, is um, in the AI forum, uh, I, you know, I spoke to Senate, some of you guys might have been there, um, and I, I basically said, what I'm very worried about is the combination of these hard uh, cyber hacking operations and AI-driven influence campaigns. So we saw something very similar post solar um, death where Kuwait, uh, their Twitter handle, an official government Twitter handle was hacked and it spread uh, disinformation about the American military presence being completely gone from the region and people started to be like, oh, what's happening? Oh. So that kind of stuff, but an uptick in that is what I do anticipate us seeing, you know, that is in the more fanciful realm um, and, and less mundane and practical, but, but I do think we should still be on guard, even if we didn't see it in 2024, we should still be on guard about um, that combination of AI-driven influence operations and the, the combination with cyber hacking. And not to take us too far from, from Oma's original Sorry, Oma. question, <laughs> if I can hop in. I actually, this goes to my initial comment about I think we also need to think about this broader than just generative AI, because one of the things that I think there is some potential opportunities for AI for is in, for example, protecting the cybersecurity in elections, <laughs> identifying those potential threats of a campaign being hacked, of is this coming from the uh, Russians, is this coming from the Chinese, is this coming from you know, some sort of foreign manipulative source trying to engage in all of those phishing expeditions that we all go through all those cybersecurity trainings on, but that way you have that kind of pre-response rather than just relying on your campaign staff having been properly cybersecurity trained. I want to stick to this AI apocalypse that, that never happened. Um, a lot of the fears stemmed from the fact that this was the first election cycle that we saw the emergence of so many new AI tools, and it was so widely accessible. Um, and at the same time, federal government kind of lagged beha behind in terms of responding. There was a lot of public pressure for Congress to step in and try to respond to mitigate some of these risks around the election. Um, legislation was floated to, you know, prevent the spread of deep fakes in the political, um, on the campaign trail. Legislation wasn't passed, so folks were really freaked out about what could happen. But there seems to be already some existing levers in place that help stemmed some of these major risks. I was hearing a little bit about foreign influence, public repercussions. I mean, the Biden robocall, the private carrier that held that call was penalized afterwards. So are there already some public pressures in place that helped mitigate some of these bigger risks from AI? I'll take the first crack, if all right. Um, so one thing we did see this year is that the FCC announced that um, a ruling that the TCPA, the Telecom Telecommunications Consumer Protection Act does regulate robocalls that include artificially generated speech, uh, which does include kind of the robocall of uh, deepfake of, of Joe Biden. So there were kind of some instances where political candidates were already using voice um, uh, altering technology or voice generation technology um, for their uh, communications. Like there was a candidate in the in Pennsylvania that was using it um, in her run for Congress, for instance. Uh, so you know, so so there were some instances where uh, kind of otherwise appropriate uh, use of uh, AI technologies were, uh, were caught up by, by changes to the TCPA or kind of announcements of TCPA regulation. That said, um, the TCPA doing that obviously was a agency regulatory decision that could be done in short order. I think made a lot of sense given the threats to in the environment that, that we were seeing at the time. Um, uh, that said, the TP TCPA does have um, a number of gaps, right? Like it doesn't regulate um, non-commercial use of uh, robocalls, for instance. So uh, non profit or um, religious institutions sending these sorts of calls would not be regulated. Um, any calls to 
landlines uh, would not be regulated, right? So there are kind of these loopholes that the FCC has been very public um, in their uh, calls for uh, closing some of those loopholes. For instance, another one is the um, auto dialer loophole. So if you are not using a, um, a, a system to that that auto generates um, phone numbers, uh, that you know just a randomized dialer does does not count as uh, as something that they regulate. For instance, so that you know there there are some places where additional regulatory loopholes can be closed to make the regulation that is in place more effective. But that said, more is needed um, in, in this space. Uh, you know, whether that looks like um, agency regulation or uh, you know new lawmaking, I think is is a conversation uh, to to be had, and um, we'll, we'll kind of see what happens this next administration. When it comes to AI and these issues in general, I think we have to ask first, is this a new problem? Or is this a problem that we've already addressed and that we're just seeing AI be the new overlay on that? Um, and that can, or is it a problem that we've long had disagreements about how to possibly address and we're also just seeing AI be added to that uh, complicated discussion? Many of these concerns, as was mentioned, there, there are already existing methods of redress and the issue is not the technology, the issue is the person using it in the wrong way. And so we have to be very careful not to wrongly malign a technology that can be used for plenty of benign and beneficial uses. Um, among those, I get concerned about some of the broadness we've seen in the definitions of AI and the broadness we've seen in some of the potential applications when there have been these attempts to potentially regulate AI in the election space. Because this could take away many beneficial things, particularly for candidates that may not have the funds that a national campaign has. The ability to use AI audio editing on your campaign ads or on your podcast, the ability to use AI translation software or auto captions to reach certain constituencies that might not otherwise be able to be reached if we just broadly were to ban the use of AI in elections could easily get caught up in such situations. Then there's also the questions of when it's not just elections, it's more broadly political speech or candidates for political office, the potential impact on First Amendment rights, the way that these could impact things like political parodies that either may use AI tools in their creation, but even if not, just the mere portrayal of a candidate or a political issue could be enough in some cases to either trigger the law or to cause a hesitancy that would lead to a silencing effect that could more broadly affect political discourse. I have a line that I peddle around to, to you guys all over the hill, um, and it's tech development will always outpace attempts to govern it. And I think, you know, when I was working uh, at Facebook at their headquarters in, in California, I, I, I also tell this little vignette all the time is when government people would come over to meet with us, we would always just push the timeline as much as we could to the right. We would, you know, send the lowest level person to meet with them because we'd sort of thought, all right, you know, the government, they're, they're not going to do anything to us anyway. They're just sort of wasting our time. They're toothless. And we are the locus of power in the universe right now. Um, you know, that was back in 2016, 2017, so times have changed a little bit, but that, that sort of informed what we do, at least in my research organization, when we think about the regulation of these technologies or potential regulation of these technologies. And the conclusion that we've generally reached is that you always have to hew toward transparency. So if you look at when it comes to, you know, the use of AI in, in campaigns and when it comes to elections, uh, you know, our big thing has been let's promote labeling, let's promote watermarks, you know, let's promote those industry solutions that they are mobilizing towards and have mobilized towards, especially this year, um, and let the American people make their own decisions with the most information possible. Now, as you guys know, the devil's always in the details when it comes to these things, but I think if we hew towards the side of transparency, um, you're, you're, that's going to win the day among the libertarians, among the conservatives, among um, others um, on, on the center left and the left and the progressive left as well. Um, you really, really can't go wrong. And what else I would say to that when it comes to AI generally, um, this is sort of the, the macro version, is 
if there's a way to, as, as long as technically feasible, make sure that AI explainability is paramount because you have to have a method to audit these computational systems, especially because this technology, like electricity, is going to is already so transformative, it is going to affect you know, every layer of society. So if we are able to account for the outputs of these systems and machines, the more the better. So as you guys are, are writing up legislation and, and concocting these plans to, to attempt to, to govern these technologies for the good of the American people, I would submit that um, adhering to transparency whenever possible is probably the right and most unobjectionable way to go. So I think there's a distinction between transparency as a best practice and transparency as a government mandate that can be really important. You will um, Particularly in space, yeah. As I say, you were worried we were going to agree the whole time. Um, so I think that wh why that is, distinction is important goes back to that problem of AI is often very broadly defined in these laws. And what we have seen is a market response that most platforms have some sort of policy around when AI content has to be has to be labeled or whether or not they'll allow certain AI content. We've seen certain products like Adobe launch AI watermarking within their products for those that are using it for creative purposes. But when you start having a government mandate around that, it's no longer as adaptive to a particular platform. So think about some of your very image forward platforms, your TikToks, your, your Instagrams, where you have popular filters. Is that something that then if you throw a filter on something, that's labeled AI? If you used AI to clean up the background in that photo, you used Facetune tools or something like that, is that going to be labeled as AI manipulated? And to a point that Tim made, is that going to then actually undermine the initial purpose behind this transparency? If everything's labeled as AI generated or AI manipulated, does that create a sort of warning fatigue where now consumers don't know how to distinguish between something that's potentially misleadingly using AI and the fact that something just had a filter over it or used autocorrect to clean up the caption or to change the caption to the language of the target audience or, or something like that. Jennifer, you mentioned every company has their own set of policies when it comes to AI tools. D did you all get a sense of maybe some greater responsibility on tech companies, especially you know coming off of 2016 and previous election cycles, the amount of scrutiny they've been under in terms of their, the role that they play when it comes to our elections, a greater sense of responsibility for them to try to self-regulate, especially in absence of, of greater federal rules when it came to AI in this election cycle. I think you saw a lot of different responses and I think it's not necessarily just from government pressure, it's also from what consumers want. It's that consumers want to know what they can expect given that they know this technology is out there when they go to a platform. And to that transparency as a best practice as opposed to a top-down mandate, I think we're starting to see a response to that that can lead to societal norms emerging that as we've encountered other new technologies in the past, whether it was the camera and the photograph or video or any other kind of new communication technology, can help arrive at some societal norms that are often an underappreciated portion of this conversation. Can we fight a little bit? Yeah. Fight. Okay, all right. Um, yeah, I, I, I just think, and you know, I don't, I don't like to draw too much from you know anecdotes because it's fundamentally I'm serious. But, but I do think spending time um, at these tech companies does change your perspective of how much credit to give the market um, and then how much credit to give the government. Uh, if you look at an example like the Kids Online Safety Act, now all of a sudden Instagram magically has a teen user, you know, technical solution. So I just from my own experience being in a big tech company and now being outside and, and working mostly with you guys now, um, tech companies, they will not move or act unless they feel some pressure from people with power, unless there is teeth in proposed legislation, unless they get really serious. Um, we kind of understand now what perks up Tim Cook's ears, what perks up Mark Zuckerberg's ears, um, rumblings on the Hill. We've come a long way from the you know 2016 days where we just didn't really care about the, the government emissaries coming over to us at MPK. Um, I, I think people do, uh, in these tech companies, they do understand 
understand that Washington is serious. They understand that um, you guys do have levers and the American people are asking for a lot of these things as well. Um, that's the thing. And, and, you know, not just to talk about kids and tech and, um, you know, that scourge really, but, but every person that I talk to on the ground, we do a lot of traveling in the States because federalism is paramount and those labs of democracy are, are what we care about um, a lot at my organization. Um, but, but you hear sort of a resounding uh, message from the American people that the status quo isn't working, that these, you know, entities with centralized power really do have too much control over our lives and the information environment in general, and we want an element of self-governance back. And if the people that we pick to represent us in the legislature here can, can start to do that and light a fire under these companies, then I do think it has had an effect in the past few years. And I think it could have an effect, especially on these big tech companies who are trying to create, um, who are trying to capture, frankly, uh, the use of, of AI technologies for themselves at the expense of competitors and new entrants. I know we're still really digesting the aftermath of the election and whether or not AI had as significant of an impact. But at least if we want to stick with the generative AI before we move to other use cases, was there some impression that because these deep fakes were out there, it did have an impact in the sense of maybe sowing partisan divides or deepening them, or maybe creating some more division within the country? And, and, and that in turn could then affect the elections and electoral process? I, I, I think that uh, is something that research is still working to, you know, to, to quantify. However, there, I think one of many of the kind of goals of information operations is to, um, to increase kind of polarization in, in the electorate to undermine um, Americans, uh, America's kind of uh, domestic image in the international uh, realm, right? And I think that some of those things have uh, have been borne out um, in a variety of ways, right? So we've seen that like a bot networks on platforms are increasingly um, uh, seeking to undermine the credibility of certain political candidates. One thing that CDT has done research on re uh, this year was uh, that the amount of hate speech targeting um, uh, black female candidates was uh, was extremely significant, um, uh, right? You know, so so the kind of AI can be used to accelerate existing trends in um, uh, in polarizing the electorate or uh, you know leading to harmful outcomes. Um, I think you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, I think we're still working to figure out to the extent that that's true. We also released a report this year um, in uh, September where we analyzed kind of five different major chatbots for their responses um, to questions about disability and voting. And one of the major findings that we discovered was that out of kind of 77 questions we asked about disability and voting, that uh, a quarter of all responses could dissuade, impede, or prevent um, a, a person with disabilities from exercising their right to vote. So it's not only that um, foreign governments and domestic agents can increase polarization of the electorate using these tools, but also that use of the tools themselves can unfortunately incidentally and accidentally mislead voters um, about how to exercise their vote, which is uh, you know, kind of separate from the polarization question, but an equally important outcome of uh, some of the ways in which these tools can have unintended consequences. Yeah, I'd say enhance and sharpen is sort of the name of the game, just as you said. Um, so nothing cataclysmic that we've seen in terms of intensifying that polarization, but they, they make a lot of it more effective and can make a lot of that more effective. So I know we discussed a lot of the harms, potential harms, but I want to pivot now to how AI, how we did see AI help candidates and help during the election process. I mean, Jennifer, you mentioned a couple examples of other use cases in which candidates found AI useful for translation services and other tools, um, but give, give me a few more examples and where you see AI continuing to help during the election process. Well, I will first point out that it's one of those things of once we get used to it, AI quits being AI. So if you're, you know, using talk to text on your phone, you're using AI. If you're using a mapping program that auto reroutes you to the fastest uh, route to get from campaign event A to campaign event B, you're using AI. If you're 
using uh, search engines, you're probably using some form of AI as well. So I think that there are a lot of ways that you are using AI that are not seen as AI, but they're not that big shiny chat GPT or Dolly generative AI element. Um, again, there are a lot of other ways that we are seeing AI used in all sorts of media, whether it's podcasts using AI for audio editing, um, whether it's the ability to, as I mentioned, do auto captions on a meeting or on some sort of um, other, uh, some sort of town hall or some sort of uh, live event. These are all opportunities that are made more easily available thanks to this technology than they would have been when you had to hire someone to to do uh, you know to transcribe an event or had to um, couldn't you know run the event on TV or, or things like that and the benefits you know saves time makes candidates more efficient reduces it's workload more accessible yeah. to a variety of, of voters as well and then I think there's also this voter education element um, you know of course there are concerns about the accuracy of the information the same way there are concerns about the accuracy of any information one can find online but the ability of a small business owner to say put in a topic let's pick a popular topic of tariffs and say how would these tariffs impact my business or would these tariffs impact my business can you give me three pros and three cons or something like that that would enable them to access more information about a topic that may matter to them deeply on a, a personal level with something that would have otherwise been much more time consuming or, or more difficult to obtain that information. Yeah, I'd say we saw it become sort of a, a force multiplier for less resourced campaigns. I mean, you, you talk about the analysis of microdata from some of the commercial data brokers. You know, if you don't have uh, a consulting budget for that kind of thing, then these technologies can do that. And they did do that. Um, it enabled near real time analysis of some voting behavior, which helps you allocate your resources more effectively if you know exactly if this is going to be more efficacious by putting these resources here or there. Um, based off of predictive modeling. Um, so, so yeah, just a really the, that mundane sort of uh, helping reach a potentially undecided voters in swing districts with, or swing regions and areas too, with more targeted messaging due to the fact that you could have more highly granular uh, targeted uh, data, data profiles of voters. So, so yeah, I think it basically, if I were to sum it up, I would say it's a force multiplier for people who don't have the resources and, and the money, frankly, that uh, some of the bigger campaigns had. One thing I'll add to the conversation here is it's not just the campaigns who, ben who can benefit from certain yeah. uses of this technology. It's also folks like election officials. Uh, some election officials around the country did things like created uh, small language model chatbots on their website that gave FAQs to voters during, vote uh, during hours where their offices weren't open to take phone calls, for instance, um, which can be a great way of getting out authoritative information about how and when to go out and vote. Uh, we also saw that, you know, another thing is it's not just generative AI, as, uh, as Jennifer mentioned previously. AI in general has been used by election officials in a variety of ways, um, as small as you know, using it to read um, uh, a marked-in ballot um, a bubble, right, which is like a classic AI use. Um, uh, that said, separate from those things, there's also kind of future use cases for election administrators that I think are worth considering. Um, one could be taking kind of um, publicly available transit data and combining it with a list of voters in a precinct to figure out where to where to put a voting location to most effectively have it situated so that people can get to it. Uh, you can also use it for post-election analysis to figure out um, if you're allocating your resources to polling places appropriately or if you need to increase your um, the number of uh, poll books or, or um, uh, you know, voting booths or uh, or staff, right? Uh, those sorts of things can can definitely reduce long lines on uh, on election day um, and increase the effect uh, the efficiency of operations for election officials. Uh, so, so just want to mention that you know there are positive use cases of this technology in administering elections, not just for the political campaigns. So thinking about the future and the next elections, upcoming elections already, um, you know, what role should Congress play, if any? Obviously, there's been plenty of legislation introduced this time, this Congress, and we'll likely not see it get passed by the end of this year. Um, but these issues are going to remain top priority, and they're going to keep coming up in the next Congress and future Congresses. So what role do legislators have, and what gaps can they fill? 
Yeah, I think there's a role for Congress to play in terms of just creating basic guardrails. Um, and, you know, as Jennifer said, there, there's a lot of unintended consequences, and these have to be, you know, carefully and narrowly scoped um, as, as insofar as, as much as possible. Um, but I, I think on the transparency angle, that's, I'll come back to it, that's the thing that I think the government does have a role in. Um, you know, you might not be able to force a company to do it, but if you can promote it as much as possible and incentivize that as much as possible, I think um, that is going to be a, a pretty good start. So from a, a proactive point of view, I think there are a couple things. First, I think we still have an opportunity to have a really positive, optimistic discourse around how America can continue to lead in the development of this technology and have a similar approach to what we've seen with past information technologies like the Internet. Um, and so I think there, there still is a lot of opportunities to really embrace AI technology, what that looks like for Congress, I think some of it is looking at, are there existing laws that already resolve the concerns? As I mentioned, is this actually a new AI concern or is this something that there's already existing laws on the books? Are there actually barriers to these positive deployments of AI? Are there things that are, in, are at existing agencies that mean you cannot deploy AI in some of these positive ways because of how the existing law is written? Then there is the kind of other issue that is likely to emerge between now and the next set of elections, and that is concerns about a potential growing state patchwork. We've seen Colorado pass a state um, AI law. There was almost one passed in California. Several more states are considering comprehensive AI legislation. There's been a lot of conversation on the privacy patchwork and the potential consequences and problems with that approach. And while I'm often a big fan of federalism too, <laughs> in AI, this could create huge issues both for the development and the deployment of this technology um, that just leads to, to broad disruption. Oh, can I say one more thing before Tim just, uh, dazzles us with his um, data points, which I've really appreciated so far? Um, I think also your role here is, is to really create a permissive environment for open source AI models and technologies and tools to thrive. So uh, I think it's pretty important to, to Jennifer and myself and, and those of us you know, on the, the center right side um, for, for us to have as many options as we can because my nightmare would be you know, a set of say big five big tech companies controlling the foundation models that we build all the rest of, um, of our AI tools on. So, and I think that would have major implications for elections and major implications for public trust as well. So as long as uh, you guys can help us keep an environment that is open to having open source technologies that'll help new entrants, that'll help competitors thrive and help create um, as, as many models and tools as possible without being controlled by a a certain set of companies that I, I maintain are in a Silicon Valley echo chamber, then everything is really going to flow from there when it comes to AI and the information environment. Sorry, Tim. <laughs> Not at all. Um, I, I'll, there are, you know, something like 20 states already have legislation regulating the use of deep fake, deep fakes um, in political campaigns almost all require transparency uh, rather than outright prohibition. The only state uh, that uh, has done that, I think uh, Michigan and uh, California both kind of created outright prohibitions. California was overturned very quickly um, for, for First Amendment grounds very justifiably. Uh, so, you know, there are reasonable um, uh, First Amendment concerns about uh, over-regulating this, this space in part for, uh, for political speech grounds. Uh, that said, um, you know, We've talked a little bit about the issues with how you define what generative AI tools are, are period, and then what uh, what are allowable uses of those uh, through this sort of regulation is definitely something to, to consider. Um, uh, CDT also has has been very much on the record in support of, of open source technologies um, as well. So you know I think there is a lot to consider whether or not it's uh, something that Congress has the bandwidth for this year. I think is yeah, yet to be seen. I think we have time for one more question, and then we're going to open it up to the audience for some questions, too, so be thinking of some. Um, you mentioned a lot about transparency, disclosures. What are some other alternative proposals? You know, there's, there's been an effort out there in, mainly to protect artists um, in terms of their name, image, and likeness uh, against deepfakes, for example. 
Um, is that an area where you also see politicians leaning into or might being effective in the space? Or what are the potential implications of that as well? I was hoping you wouldn't uh, ask this question because I don't have an answer to it. Um, and, and we've been thinking about it pretty hard in terms of IP. Um, clearly, this burst into the public consciousness with uh, the release of GPT-4 and now what you know, New York Times and OpenAI and, and all of those battles that have yet to be decided um, in the, the judiciary. Um, I, I don't know. We know, you know, HR, uh, what, 9551, um, so the, the No Fakes Act, um, that has been proposed um, both in the House and the Senate, uh, House and Senate version, excuse me. Um, we don't have an official position on that, but I, uh, I'll give the unsatisfactory answer is this is going to keep rearing its ugly head. And it is, it is really jumbling coalitions, too. I mean, you see it's, it's a, a bipartisan um, uh, proposal as well. And, and people, you know, we have people who, who say every business case sort of turns on the ability for them to, you know, make money and you're, you're going to stymie innovation and whatnot if you don't let people, um, you know, keep some of these things proprietary and, and whatnot. But, but I also do think people have a right to, you know, their own image and likeness. Um, and... Um, you know, people have worked hard to cultivate that kind of thing as well. And uh, you, the former CTO of OpenAI's um, non-answer was was very telling when she gave an interview, and they asked if um, you know her some of their their models were trained on a lot of this open source data, and she didn't really want to say because I think these have sort of yet to be sussed out. Um, and and I don't have a very good answer, but I think it's going to come up again and again and again. I don't know. Maybe Jennifer and Tim know the answer to this one. I often joke IP is about the one area of tech policy that I don't touch. Um, <laughs> but I, I have thought some about the question of regulation in this kind of deep fake, anti-deepfakes or, or anti-duplication type of thing. And I understand it's a complicated issue. I do think we have to consider not only the, the kind of open source debate and what's publicly available and the IP debate in this, but also the First Amendment debate. And what this might mean, particularly in that you could be creating a kind of moderator's dilemma in many cases if you're going to hold the companies themselves liable for this type of content because they're going to tend towards the risk of our side. So what does that mean for something as common as Saturday Night Live parodies? What does that mean for, you know, the AI generated office skit of like former presidents? <laughs> but if you can't have AI generated content, companies are going to be less likely to host that because it takes a lot of time, attention, and review to dis distinguish between that and something that would, you, you could say, well, that's clearly parody, that you know has First Amendment protection, but when you're having to make that split sec second decision, you're not necessarily going to be able to distinguish between those two things. And when liability is attached, that means you're more likely to take it down than to leave it up. So I think it certainly is a complicated issue. The other thing I question is how would this impact some of those potential beneficial uses of AI for campaigns that we've talked about as well. So Kara brought up the idea of some of these products out there that could help candidates prep for a debate because it's based on your opposing candidate. Um, even if it's not a physical image, it's going to react or speak, or maybe it even uses their voice, maybe yeah. it doesn't. Is that the type of thing that's going to be banned? I think we can all imagine that that's something that could be useful, is not designed to manipulate the political process, is something that you know an individual office could even use in prepping for a hearing. But if you see how broadly these definitions are phrased, phrased sometimes, there's a lot more technology than just perhaps the harmful use or the unsanctioned use of someone's name, image, and likeness involved. And what you do want to avoid, you know, another nightmare scenario that I have, a lot of nightmare scenarios, are, you know, uh, the Douglas Mackey situation, right? So somebody who's, you know, facing down uh, almost a decade in prison for tweeting out a meme with um, the, the wrong voter information. So that is something that we do think seriously about as an issue. Okay, I think we'll open it up to the audience if anybody has any questions.
really frowned upon as far as cultural norms go, things like email. And then, you know, a decade later, texting, um, the same way people were just like, don't text me, post motivation. Now we're apparently very comfortable with that. Is it just a matter of time of people being acclimated to these new technologies? Uh, so, I mean, I, you know, part of it is people become more familiar with things slowly over time. Uh, you know, internet literacy is still something that is uh, developing, I think, for a lot of parts of, of the country and around the world that, uh, you know, whether or not that is um, uh, something that plays in to this, I think, is mostly a question around do, um, is there likely to be some sort of kind of revolutionary change in, in how likely people are to believe this sort of content? And I, I don't think it's gonna be the case. I think it'll be a slow adoption um, over time as people become more familiar and aware of these risks. You know, we are seeing that threats have emerged in new platforms where people are less familiar that it's a risk, right? So phishing campaigns could be much more successful if they send someone a text message versus sending them an email where they have a little bit more information about the sender. Um, those are the sorts of threats that we're seeing um, where people are you know, creating a deep fake of their uncle and asking for extra money or something like that that could be um, uh, persuasive on a fraud, straight up fraud side of things. The same of principles apply when it comes to, to solutions, which is that I think public education um, around these sorts of threats is really important. CDT partnered with the ARP last year to, or this year, to, um, to develop pu public education campaigns to get out information to AARP members about the sorts of phishing techniques and threats that they might be more likely to see that could do things like discourage them from voting or tell them false information about the time, place, and manner of voting um, in the same way that they might see those things when it comes to fraud attempts against their bank account or other, uh, other threats. But, you know, these sorts of things are a slow process. A lot of people are not all that great at using a cell phone to begin with, much less knowing which text message was sent from a potentially harmful source. I think that, you know, I, my background in law and you can't have a lawyer on a panel without them saying it depends at least once. And so this is the it depends. And I, I think that it depends a lot on how this technology evolves, whether this technology evolves in a way that we really embrace the idea of voice or whether it's something that maybe, you know, in a couple of election cycles, the idea of a campaign having its own ch chat bot on the website that voters can go to and interact with. So I think it's too soon to predict what that level of technology we're going to get comfortable with is and what's going to kind of always be that uncanny valley or that, oh, that's kind of weird or creepy type of, of thing as well. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm pretty much in agreement. Um, it, it depends is, is correct in this instance. And especially what we've seen with AI development, I mean, you know, from, from 2018 to now, it's pretty much come in fits and starts. Um, I remember when GPT-2 released elements um, of, of that model uh, and nobody really cared, right? They open source a lot of it and everyone's like, okay, yeah, whatever. And then GPT-4 comes along and now there's a huge it's public interest. And if, if you're on X, you know, you see the, the, the explosion of, of synthetic media. Um, so, so I do think that um, the population is getting a little more uh, sensitized to it, and, and I do think that will continue apace. Um, whether or not we, we like it uh, or not, um, it r remains to be seen, but people understand that it's an existing reality and it's going to continue, so we'll get used to it. Any others?
Yeah, I think, um, you know, that's why, you know, our friends at, at places like the, the Foreign uh, Malign Influence Center um, at ODNI and uh, are, are critical, you know, understanding that foreign adversaries don't sleep uh, and they have um, entire teams and groups devoted to uh, manipulating and influencing uh, the information environment that is um, used by American citizens in particular. I mean, we, we've documented this for, for a very, very long time. Um, and, you know, China, Russia, Iran, uh, North Korea, they're, they're trying to uh, find any vulnerabilities they can. Um, you hear people talk about, you know, the cognitive domain and how important it is to shore that up um, in addition to the, the real technical attack surfaces uh, that you deal with every day. So um, I think the more people can understand where uh, a lot of these issues are coming from, like we have legitimate foreign adversaries like Iran who are looking at voter databases that are, that are actually hacking and using that type of micro-targeting that is good for campaigns to use because you reach more people, you reach more American citizens, you get them more engaged in the process, but they're sort of using that against us to, um, as Tim alluded to, potentially incite physical, uh, you know, connect the digital and the physical world in ways that we don't, yeah, we don't want the body politic to um, to partake in at this point, you know, if you're a responsible American citizen concerned with American sovereignty. Um, so, so yes, I think understanding that we have enemies out there who hate us, they do. It's, it's very simple. It's not like, you know, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. We have people who want to harm the United States interests. We have the Houthis attacking U.S. vessels in the Red Sea, you know, Iranian proxies. Um, that is happening as we speak. We have China uh, that is, you know, very much looking to exploit our next generation wireless that is flying surveillance balloons over the continental United States, uh, scooping up as much uh, SIGIN as they possibly can. So understanding that reality, having people who are working in these offices um, in the intelligence community who are devoted to that with a clear foreign nexus and foreign attribution, I think is very critical to keep the American citizen informed. And so they have their eyes open. I think also I would add education is often an underappreciated policy tool, and I don't mean that in the sense of like K-12 or higher education education. I mean in the sense of making sure people are aware of the risks that they may be at, you know, that they're aware of what information they may encounter, that they know where to find the resources, both from trusted government sources as well as, you know, if they are someone who is engaged in content creation of some time, how to do that kind of due diligence, how to ask those critical questions so that they're making sure that they're making the choice that they want to make. I, I did want to squeeze in one final one for our last two minutes here, um, just because we didn't touch on it, if I may, um, separately. How might an incoming Trump administration and now a new Republican congressional majority shift the national conversation on AI, if, if at all? I mean, how might we see a pivot from what we're talking about now or not? Yeah, I mean, I don't, um, you know, speak for uh, any anyone um, in the incoming administration, um, but my read, given, you know, studying especially what Vice President-elect uh, Vance has said, um, is he, he seems to be a fan of open sourcing um, a lot of these AI models and tools, um, and at least having a regulatory environment that is conducive to their development. Um, so I think that's one thing. I think open source is going to get hot again, which I'm totally excited about. Um, and I think uh, there, this is actually just me um, uh, prognosticating, but in terms of privacy, I think it, it's, it's really important, um, and especially now to conservatives, especially in guarding against a, a commercial and, um, and you know, public surveillance state that we've seen. Um, I did a couple of rotations at the National Security Agency, and I know how powerful these tools are. Um, I think, uh, you know, approaches to machine learning that are, uh, that are privacy preserving are, are critical, and I think we'll, we'll see a lot of that. We have seen that um, in the current administration in terms of the privacy by design efforts that have been integrated into some proposed legislation and um, uh, executive orders and whatnot. So the, the privacy preserving element, I think they'll retain, I think there'll be more of an emphasis on open sourcing um, and, and making, you know, new entrants and competitors, uh, putting them on a degree of a level playing field with um, these big tech companies that have that high volume and variety of data and compute resources that require, um, you know, refining algorithms and better AI uh, model outputs in general. Um, so, so I think those are, are, are two quick things that we might see 
uh, in the AI space, one that will change and then one that will um, kind of remain the same. The last thing I'll say is um, thresholds for compute. Um, so we've seen, you know, flops and all of that discussion. You know, here's, you know, where you, here's a line kind of thing. I, I don't think they're going to retain um, that threshold. I think it's it's going to be really critical for every, you know, individual, every family, um, every entity to have access to compute. Um, you guys might have seen the meme where it's like GPUs on your back and it's like come and take it. I see a lot more of that ethos um, permeating the next administration when it comes to AI. I will add really quick, the one thing we did see um, stated in the Republican platform on AI was to revoke the Biden executive order on AI. So I think it's likely that you will see that executive order revoked, whether you see it revoked and replaced or whether you see it revoked and then continued congressional debate on what to do, I think is still a, a bit of an open question. There were comments made in the prior Trump administration, and I don't just mean comments, I mean OMB statements, things like that, on AI, it's often forgotten that AI did exist before like two years ago. Um, folks, like, folks like those of us on this panel were talking about it, like it just wasn't a room full of people. Um, and that, how, but given the change in the technology, how much of that returns versus how much has shifted in general, I think it's hard to, to predict because this is such a rapidly changing technology and therefore the policy and politics around it are also rapidly changing. Tim, if you want to wrap this up. Sure. I, I'm actually going to gracefully um, uh, pass on the prognostication, but I did want <laughs> to answer that last question, if yeah. you don't mind, yeah, yeah, from the it. audience uh, around kind of foreign interference and ways the, the things that are necessary to, to um, intervene. I think in addition to kind of government regulation, the FMIC is obviously a super important one. We saw ODNI consistently put out these sorts of updates over the last 30 days of the election. Separate from kind of government solutions, I think that there are a number of things that can and should be being done at the, um, at, at the private company level. For instance, intelligence sharing between companies is something that was really um, unfortunately uh, made much more difficult this year. There, so like the Stanford Internet Observatory was shuttered as a result of some, um, some lawsuits that, uh, so one thing is the US election partnership, which was kind of a, a, a place for misinformation, information sharing um, didn't exist. And so, you know, there's an argument that um, less intelligence sharing across platforms to identify misinformation and disinformation um, and remove it uh, was happening than, than we've seen in 2020. Another thing is that I, there also have been kind of some uh, researcher access issues. So for instance, um, X made it really expensive to access their API to pull data. So it's harder to like understand at scale what sort of threats are happening on their platform. We also saw Meta shut down CrowdTangle, for instance, which is another platform that a lot of researchers used for this sort of information. So I will really emphasize that I think researcher access is an area that there's a lot of work to be done to facilitate and ensure that we're able to actually understand what misinformation is happening on these platforms. So. Lots happening and lots will continue to happen in this space, so keep an eye out. And thank you to our panelists and thank you all for being here today.